Welcome everyone to our first seminar of our seminar series here in fall 2021. We're extremely excited to have Dr. Jared Colton and Christopher Phillips here to talk about a chapter from their, a ch their chapter from Resilient Pedagogy, which is the ETE open book from last year. And they will be discussing a new normal in inclusive, usable online learning experiences. So they are going to introduce themselves. If at any point you have a question, feel free to raise your hand in the, in, on Zoom or type your question into the chat box on Zoom. We have a moderator who will be sending those questions up to our presenters. And without further ado, um, Jared and Chris, go ahead. Uh, first, we're going to give you a little bit of background of ourselves, like Sam said, how we kind of came to some of the work we're going to talk about. Um, and then we're going to discuss some of the, the chapter that Sam mentioned. Uh, we hope to have enough time to uh, answer questions at the end and also uh, to hear about your own experiences with accessibility. Uh, so I'll start first. In the summer of 2014, so how long ago is that? Seven plus years ago? Specifically, like how media and te technological media change and can be persuasive in and of themselves, I decided to attend a panel on machine rhetorics, or the idea that the, the machine that you're using actually has its own persuasive power. And there were a lot of prominent scholars on that panel, but the one who made the strongest impact was Sean Zdenek, who is a disability studies scholar. His argument resonated with me that the most marginalized population in the United States is people with disabilities, and that teachers and scholars invested in technology specifically could do something about that. As a result, I decided to incorporate, at like a, the, the dumb new professor I was, uh, disability studies and accessibility into the first class I taught at USU. <laughs> um, now, I do have a little bit of background in ethics and postmodern, post-human theory, which if anyone who studies disability studies knows that there are lots of connections with those things. So it wasn't like I was completely unfamiliar with it. But I was not, um, I, my dissertation wasn't on accessibility or anything like that. Um, so I created a course with a service learning component in which the students would produce uh, captioned videos uh, for various community groups in the, in the local, in the Cache Valley area. Uh, specifically community groups that, have, that help folks with disabilities. And, but my sense of what my students could accomplish and the expectations of those groups was so far from connecting that I doubt like they, any of them use any of the things my students created. <laughs> um, nevertheless, even though that happened and the students' projects failed in some sense, uh, my interest in getting students to work on accessibility projects made some minor news. I can't remember how Christopher heard about me, but um, and so shortly after that, Christopher reached out in an email uh, saying that he had heard I was doing some accessibility work in my courses, wanted to know if we could collaborate. Uh, I was actually slow to respond, mainly because I was worried I was going to be exposed as a fraud, um, I had, that I had been found out. <laughs> beyond, even though my intentions were good, beyond some mental health disabilities that are in my family, I felt like a lot of the work I was doing was related to people that I, wasn't, that, that I didn't have really personal experience with except in those relationships that I had built in that class already. Um, and I was worried that Christopher was going to be like, what are you doing? <laughs> so I'll let, I'll let Christopher introduce himself, and, the, um, uh, and then I'll continue after that. Uh, oh, thank you, Jared. Uh, appreciate that introduction. Uh, my name is Christopher uh, Phillips. Uh, my, my role or t title on campus, um, in fact, this... Uh, let me just, uh, there we go, is uh, electronic, it's not a very accessible title, but um, electronic and information technology accessibility coordinator. Uh, I, I think the best way maybe to describe um, the work that I do on campus is, is most of you um, are probably familiar with the Disability Resource Center. Um, when you have a student with a disability in your course or a class that you teach, they'll reach out to you and kind of let you know what we need to do reactively to make sure that student um, has all of the accommodations and support they need in a classroom. Um, and, and 
their work is fantastic and, 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 and so important. And, and my role is sort of to complement that and to work proactively. And we'll talk a little bit more about reactive and proactive work a little bit later. Um, but to do, see what we can do to proactively make sure your course content is going to be as accessible and inclusive as possible. Um, Background-wise, I, I started out in special education at a high school. Um, and since then, have, have, have worked in a number of kind of disability technology fields. I've been here at Utah State for about six years. Um, another part of my story I just wanted to share real quick. Uh, this is a picture of, of two of my brothers. Um, if you've been here at Utah State for a long time and eaten at the Hub, you, you may know Patrick. Um, up until COVID, he'd, he'd been at the Hub for uh, 20 plus years. Um, working and then my um, and we're actually Irish twins the, the exact same age every year for about a month and then my youngest brother Dallin Paul also um, uh, does some support services here here near near the university um, but but part of this just I share real quickly um, Patrick and I are so close in age together from it's never really been a part of my life um, w without disability being a, a pretty big part of it and, and even from a, a pretty young age uh, recognizing and kind of asking questions and wondering uh, why Patrick had such a, a different experience than I did in the world um, not so much because of Patrick or any uh, limitations that he might have because of Down syndrome but more about uh, just because how the world is kind of built and, and maybe not as friendly for him um, as it was f for me as someone without Down syndrome. Um, and it's always kind of driven this work and it, it, it's fun and exciting to kind of explore that in a higher education environment to think about um, when you put up a material um, on, on your online course, how and why is it different maybe for some students and their experience with it than it is for other students. Um, and I think part of this um, just introduction that, that I think that I, I really appreciate, Jared just touched on briefly, is just this idea of, of, of that vulnerability. Um, I think most people have heard the word accessibility. You may know a little bit about it, but for many people it is a little bit maybe uncomfortable or you're, uh, there's some uncertainty about it. And, and I just really appreciate Jared kind of sharing that vulnerability to, to reply to my email. Um, Goodness knows we send out a lot of emails that don't get replied to, uh, and that's okay. Um, maybe you, you, listening today, you, you have one, and, and you might uh, uh, f f feel uh, like you can reply to that after we get done talking today. Um, and, and we're not asking anybody today to become accessibility experts. We, we have that expertise that we can help and support you, but just to kind of recognize where and when um, you might need help, and then to reach out and ask for that help um, when you need it. All right, so to talk a little bit about our chapter in the book, but also just about the work we're doing, because we're continuing to do research and continue to do work on the community. Um, and to relate it to the, the, the book was that the most obvious consequence of COVID-19 for a lot of folks um, teaching has been that more students were accessing classes remotely <laughs> uh, without having the technology or necessarily the resources that they might have on their local campus. Uh, we, know that, we know also that students from underrepresented groups um, have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19 and this kind of move to online and so, and so much of that, uh, particularly students of color as well as students with disabilities. Um, and this, uh, anybody who's been research in higher education knows that this neglect, unfortunately, is not unique to the pandemic, uh, but COVID-19 made the problem even bigger. Um, we also know that a lot of stress came from dealing with the unexpected circumstances of COVID-19. Um. Am I back? Back. Okay. So I was in 2020, I think that, that was the year, correct, that COVID hit? <laughs> or at least when we had to move to online our courses. I was teaching an in-person digital media class and um, forced to go online like everybody else. Uh, when it happened, students uh, sent me emails disclosing disabilities that I hadn't known about before. Uh, one talked about dyslexia, another talked about uh, unable to be, or being unable to learn in asynchronous online environments. Um, Probably each of us heard from students who had less access to high-speed internet um, or multiple technologies, and, and many became more reliant on their phones just to take a class. Uh, I also had some, two students that just disappeared for two weeks. 
uh, and then eventually showed up after I kept emailing them um, to help, help them catch up. Um, so when many of our, our, your students stop participating, right, as a result of class going online, you tend to notice. Uh, thankfully, most, many educators have been responding to these realities of distance and distraction during this strange time um, and changing their habits to improve online uh, aspects of their teaching because they had to. Um, uh, I just feel like in, my, in general, the, the, I've seen a lot of people respond strongly to when this happened. Um, so, but, so we believe this crisis provides, has provided opportunities to uh, create a new normal, like we, like we said of this uh, the title of our talk, a new normal of inclusive content delivery. Uh, for this seminar, we want to focus specifically on the needs of students with disabilities and some specific inclusive practices that you can bring into the classroom relatively quickly and that will benefit students with and without disabilities. Uh, thank you, Jared. Um, as Jared mentioned, there's been a, a, a lot of disruption um, in the world, right? Um, and then I think personally and professionally, all of us have experienced the same. So, have every, so has every single student in, in each of our classrooms. Um, whether it's the way you teach or where you work from or the technology you use, there's just been a lot of change in the world. And while that's been um, stressful and can at times even feel a little bit overwhelming, I, I know I've felt that at, at times. There can also be some incredible opportunities that can come in this space. Uh, one of the things I, I guess I worried about as, as uh, we moved a lot of our instruction online, um, especially as COVID first happened, was that everyone would be too busy and uh, overwhelmed to care or think about accessibility. And I was so surprised um, and delighted that the exact opposite thing seemed to happen. Um, before, when we had both, um, you know, an in-person classes and online, I think there was a, a certain um, maybe just expectation that if a student really needed help, they could come and talk to you in the classroom. Um, as, as many teachers moved all of their content online, there, there just seemed to be a collective kind of realization for many instructors that, boy, I need to make sure that this content's going to be usable by all the students who are going to be in my online coursework. And so it really opened up the door for some, for some new conversations that we had with a lot of people we hadn't had conversations with before. And, and then even, I, I think, from a kind of a pedagogical practice or, or how we just choose to just share our course material, just really a lot of um, opportunities to kind of think differently about our content um, and how usable it is. Um, you know, all of us have had the experience of, of visiting different websites. Some of them are much more usable than others, and the exact same thing really applies in online courses. Um, as we have a chance to kind of visit and pop in and out of a lot of courses across campus, there are definitely courses that are more usable and easy for students to use, and courses that are, 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 are less usable um, to use. And I felt like that kind of just difference just became a lot more apparent and a lot more uh, teachers, but then also students just started to kind of recognize the value of developing a usable and inclusive course material just kind of across the board. Unfortunately, providing inclusive content isn't just as easy as like checking a box. I want this to be inclusive, right? That would be nice. Um, and it can be just as much a challenge too, even in other online spaces such as Canvas, Blackboard. Um, and to, to be inclusive in those spaces requires a shift in your perspective, but also it's going to require some change in habits. Um, and so fully understanding the range of accessibility problems that any student can encounter is overwhelming. Um, but there are starting points, and it's kind of what we're, we're leading uh, to here. Um, one of the best ways to improve your accessibility in your classroom is through universal design, or we like the term inclusive design better. Um, we'll talk uh, briefly, try to define those terms so it help people understand. But in, in brief, universal design is a philosophy that argues that if you design content for people with disabilities, you improve the content not only for those students, but for all students. And by content, I mean syllabi, syllabi assignments, course readings, those kinds of things. However, rather than make the claim or even imply that uh, one size can fit all, inclusive design means designing with the margins in mind and being willing to design in ways that create a sense of belonging for your students. Um, so inclusive design is different from traditional accessibility efforts, or kind of a, what Christopher was talking about earlier, because the former, so inclusive design is proactive, where uh, traditional accessibility efforts are almost always reactive. 
Uh, most higher education disability resource centers uh, work with instructors to provide accommodations for students that, or for a student after that student has had a documented disability and then has made a request for accommodation in their course. In most cases, this means the instructor must change an element of their course. For example, give the student a longer period of time to take an, uh, an exam. Um, or the Disability Resource Center must provide an accessible version of a document they need in the class. Uh, it could be larger print or something like that. Um, while this is accommodation process is important, necessary, and sh should remain, it is clearly a reactive process in which action is taken after a disability is disclosed. Uh, in this process, students who do not disclose disabilities, and that does happen, uh, students who would benefit from more accessible and usable content might still struggle in your class. However, instructors with inclusive design philosophies try to take a more proactive approach, meaning they might incorporate practices of accessibility usabil and usability in their everyday teaching, uh, including the following, making sure that videos uh, used in the class have closed captions, uh, using larger, more readable fonts, providing clear headings and hierarchies in their, in their materials so it's easy for students to find uh, information. Now some, some teachers might ask, why can't I just wait until I get an accommodation request? Um, and again, the disability resource centers are important and that, that accommodation process is really important. Um, and some students will require accommodations no matter how inclusive you try to be. Um, but adhering, adhering to an inclusive design philosophy proactively anticipates and assumes that no student will have the exact same experience in your class or with your materials. Uh, and so an instructor with an inclusive design approach then will proactively provide content that is more usable and more accessible to students with and without disabilities. Okay, so again, we're, we're leading to this, but the, I just want to introduce a couple more things here. But um, the, the, the goal of this seminar then is to make sure you start this process of making your co course more accessible or more inclusive. And part of that is actually thinking about that as habitual and, and proactive, that you actually can't just wait, but you actually need to like start changing your own practices. Um, we'll, we're going to discuss two specific practices that you can use, and they may seem even obvious to you. And the one is to make sure that all your videos are captioned. Um, and then two is to convert PDF files to HTML web pages, which sounds more complicated, but and we'll talk about that. But these practices not only create more accessible learning environments for students with disabilities, but they are more usable to students without disabilities as well who might be accessing this material on a mobile device or even you, or listening to it, for example, uh, your materials. Um, our goal is that these practices become a, a new normal a new pedagogical standard, and the teachers will be more com uh, confident that their materials are inclusive if they start adopting these type of practices. Um, just a really quick note, we, we're not going to discuss accessibility law today. We just wanted to point that out. Um, though universities continue to get caught up in lawsuits because they're not accessible. So uh, that's something to note, but we're not going to talk about that specifically. But rather our hope is that you kind of take this as an ethical imperative to make some slight changes or uh, to, to your pedagogical practices in the hope that um, it, you're able to make your classes more inclusive. Um, okay, so to some basic terms. Um, we want to explain how we use the terms. I've already kind of used these terms without really defining them, We're, but accessibility, usability, and inclusive design. They're often interchangeable for people, but we want to actually make some distinctions here. Um, and they're contested that's fine, we're, we're not like the, we don't think our definition is the, the end all or anything like that. But we hope that these are actually productive definitions for you to think about the three things that can be going on in accessibility, usability, and inclusive design. Okay, so accessibility. When we discuss accessibility, we mean the quality of content that enables people with disabilities to access that content across multiple contexts. So the reason why I think this is an important definition is because when I, I came up in, um, uh, academia, there was a lot of discussion about accessibility, but it had nothing to do with people with disabilities. It would just meant like using different media. And it was talking about, oh, your students might access these different ways that you access your class or your work. And they, but they weren't actually talking about specifically people with disabilities. We want that definition to be specifically 
focusing about people with disabilities. And there are many examples of students with disabilities accessing content from different contexts So we talk about here. A blind student using text-to-speech technology to read aloud questions in an exam, uh, a deaf or hard of hearing learner watching an instructional video using closed captions, a student with dyslexia being given a reading assignment in a more readable, larger font. Accessibility also means the ability to retrieve it across those technologies, like that old definition was trying to do, like I said. So that means that the student could use their laptop, a mobile phone, a braille, re braille reader, or something like this. The more inclusive we are, the more our materials are able to be accessed by these different technologies. OK, to the usability. That's the next one. Here we go. So this has been defined dozens, maybe hundreds of ways. Um, we like De Nielsen's definition, definition that a quality it, that usability is a quality attribute that assesses how easy user interfaces are to use. But we also like ISO's definition that the extent to its, that usability is the extent to which a product can be used by specific users to achieve specific goals with effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction in mind. So it's not just easy, but like how the experience is broader than that to them. Um, in other words, it is just uh, one way, if, if, it, if it does help to think of it in terms of ease of use, that's great. Um, but it's also how well it enables that person or that user to accomplish their goals. Uh, so, for example, a syllabus that uses headings to organize content in a linear, ma uh, succinct manner to help students find information they need quickly. A teacher providing content in HTML that can be read easily on a mobile device. Um, uh, uh, this, this, instead of a PDF with handwritten professor notes all over it that appears upside down, right, in whatever they're looking at, right? <laughs> um, so uh, another, another, just a really easy example of usability, though, is just a, a course that's introducing maybe a complicated subject, but it starts it with uh, jargon-free language that's helpful to a student to kind of get acclimated into that, to that subject. All right, now to this inclusive design. So we define inclusive design as design that considers the range of human experience and focuses on the needs of users on the margins to help provide a better learning experience for everyone. Is that good? Is that up there? Okay. Inclusive design acknowledges the essential nature of accessibility and proactively seeks to provide user-friendly experiences for people with and without disabilities. One way to think about this is that we, never that we should never talk about accessibility without usability. And likewise, the opposite, in my opinions. Inclusive design does not claim to be universal, uh, which may very well be impossible. Um, but it does mean pay attention, paying attention to the needs of those um, who need to be included in the context of the content you're using. Um, making sure everyone who wants a seat at the table has a, as similar experience as possible. A helpful way to consider the, uh, the relationship of accessibility and usability to inclusive design is to consider curb cuts, the small ramps built into the curbs of sidewalks that provide an easy transition uh, from sidewalk to street and vice versa. Uh, before, before curb cuts were mandated by federal disability legislation, individuals who used wheelchairs had to find creative solutions to get from street onto a sidewalk and vice versa. Uh, disability advocates uh, efforts to mandate curb cuts were initially met with complaints, not, not unlike some of the things we have actually been trying to, to push here. <laughs> um, but the, the complaints were from mainly from businesses, municipalities that were required to bear the expense, right, um, of this change, of what seemed to them to, it seemed to them a change that they were only doing for a small population. Um, however, as most of us probably know, it soon became clear that curb cuts provided lots of advantages to lots of people, different audiences, not just to folks in, wheelchair, in wheelchairs. Uh, bicyclists, skateboarders, person using a dolly, parents pushing a stroller, right? In short, they be, they've proven useful to almost everyone at one time or another, a value that has exceeded the initial intent of just being accessible for people with disabilities. So the spirit of, we, we like this because it really encapsulates the spirit of inclusive design in that it looked to, it designed with the marginalized group in mind and then ended up helping more and more people and almost everyone. Um, so just to, just to give a quick list, we, today we see inclusive design in lots of things. Accessible drinking fountains that can be used by children or shorter adults. Automatic door openers for people with mobility challenges that are useful for anyone carrying something heavy. Uh, closed captions for deaf or hard of hearing users that also benefit second language learners. Um, adequate color contrast for blind 
or colorblind users that also helps any user read, like in the sun, like when you get that glare on your phone. Um, and then voice to text technology that was designed for blind users or folks who couldn't type because of a disability, but people use it all the time now. I have a student who never registered a disability, a past student, and I found out later, listened to every single thing we, we gave her. That's how she accessed all our material. So Christopher's gonna talk about two specific examples that we can actually include in our, in our, course, in our courses. Like curb cuts, we hope that these inclusive design practices will become normal, um, benefiting students with and without disabilities alike. Thank you, Jared. Uh, a couple of things I just wanted to, to touch base on there. Um, before we get into some of these specific practices, um, one is just, uh, Jared talked about a couple of students who had disabilities but hadn't disclosed them when kind of COVID happened. And, and part of this idea here is that, now we have one of the best disability resource centers you'll find at any university, but it's still uh, just a process for a student to get an appointment. They have to get a certain amount of documentation, meet with someone. It's just, it's just a difficult process for, I mean, regardless, no matter how easy they make it for a student to kind of get to a place where they can get those accommodations. Um, and when they do that, there's incredible steps in place to kind of make sure that they have everything that they need in a course. But how incredible of a, of a message is it, or, or just a, an environment, if a student can log into your course, um, for example, and all the videos are already captioned, right? They don't need to email anybody or wait for, um, to get their captions a couple days later than everyone else. It's just this really this idea of, of what can we do to not always wait for that email to come and then like uh, worry about it and have to do whatever they tell you to do, but just to have some of these things in place. And so these are a couple of practices that are really help us in that regard. The first one we've mentioned a couple of times already today uh, is, is closed captions on videos. Um, closed captions uh, used to be, um, well again, Primarily, um, initially at least, for, for users who are deaf or hard of hearing uh, as the audience. and used to be fairly expensive and complex to, to kind of get uh, captions on your videos. Um, and really thought of as just for that specific audience. Um, but, but, but now, captions, and, and, and Jared's mentioned one, but I'd maybe just, uh, if we can, and I'll, I'll repeat anything that comes in, um, if I watch on the chat, um, what other use cases might be there for captions? Um, maybe some of you listening even, um, uh, anybody that, that, that uses captions on a regular basis. Um, I don't know the best way to put that in there. If you just want to give a, a thumbs up or a, a, a yes. Oh. Um, yeah, they're good, Jared. I, I, I have you know, kids at home and, and it's noisy. Um, and if we had a bit, all of you in an audience together, usually about half of the hands in, in, in the room go up. Um, any other use cases, though, where captions might be helpful or useful that you've experienced um, or your students, besides for students who are, who are deaf or hard of hearing? And I'll make sure to repeat any that I see come in. Good. Marilyn talks about um, just another layer of access to what we're talking about. Good, that's important. So a student might be listening to what the video says. They can also read it at the same time. And there's some, some more and more studies kind of coming out just showing the academic value of it just gets things a little bit deeper into the noggin if you're, if you're kind of uh, watching it and reading it at the same time, listening and reading at the same time. Good. Um, helped uh, Karen uh, learn English when watching TV programs when I was young. That's a huge one. Um, a, a lot of English language learners... Um, uh, or if you're learning any other language, it's, it's much easier to read um, a, a new language before you can listen to it um, most of the time, and so captions can be used for that. Um, Sarah mentioned visual learners. Good, just be able to see that out loud. Um, Sarah, again, just good. Some accents are difficult to understand. Yep, I might be watching a, a show. Um, maybe it's a deep Boston accent or something, and I'm just not quite sure what they're saying. I can turn on the captions and understand what what it is that Matt Damon's trying to tell me on that video or whatever it is. Who knows? Um, you know, but but or or in a in a classroom or again, it's just um, if you maybe have a little bit of an accent, captions might be a way just to make sure students understand what you're saying. These are good answers coming in. I love this from Sarah as well. If it's a new word you're sharing with your students, again, if you can see that typed out, that's going to be so helpful to kind of understand what that word is. Um, before you before you get that out as well. So good answers, everybody. Um, I think you mentioned most of the things that we talked about. Um, another, another big one, I guess, and this is why uh, most videos on like social media nowadays um, are, are captioned. Um, you, a lot of times you're watching or, or looking at something in a, in a context where you don't have access to audio. So you can just have the captions on, not worry about having your headphones 
Um, another, I guess the other ones I didn't put on this list, but it's just the, the top uses I've heard at least, anecdotally, but uh, bars, uh, air, airlines, um, and uh, like exercise gyms that always have captions on, right, um, when you go there. And so there's just so much value to captions. And again, um, thank you for that clarification as well, Karen. We all do have an accent. Um, my, my, I personally uh, have a, a, a southern, southeastern Idaho accent. Um, I did live in Boston for a couple of years, and some people had a difficult time understanding me. I, um, so that, that's helpful to remember. Right? Thank you very much. Uh, but again, it's just something we all benefit from captions. Um, and, and it's something that has become so easy to do. Uh, many universities, they actually ask their uh, instructors have to capture their own videos. Um, we're fortunate here at Utah State to be able to have resources. Um, you can just let us know you need captions. I'll share the email on that in just a minute, and we will just get it done for you. Um, especially right now, I um, would encourage any of you that it, whether it's uh, con video content in your fall course that's not captioned, or if you're getting ready for spring, please reach out to us and we'd love to help you get your videos captioned. One other feature that um, is coming uh, as soon as next month, I, I, I'm not making promises because it's been a little bit delayed, but it is something called an interactive transcript feature. You've maybe seen this on other websites. It's a, it's a pretty incredible feature where it takes the, the captions or the subtitles and it puts it into a little bar alongside. Um, this is kind of like uh, karaoke, I guess, but students could, could read along. And then one of the, the best features here is right there, you see that search in transcript. So especially if you have an hour-long lecture, if a student wants to go back and find a specific part of that lecture, um, they can just type in whatever that word is. They click on that phrase, and boom, it'll go right to that segment of the video. So it just makes your, your video content a much more, again, usable, um, learnable, uh, type of content for everybody to use. Uh, the other feature that will come with this is just the built-in ability for students to download that content um, at a click of a button and they can, again, if, if they're not, maybe they're not in a place where they can watch the whole video, they can at least read through it or use that to help take notes, whatever that might be. Uh, again, this is coming, uh, but, but, but make sure, you got to make sure your videos are captioned first, so reach out to us and we can help you do that. The, the, the way to do that is just send an email to captions at usu.edu. I'd love to get back to my desk and see emails from a few of you. Uh, just with your course name, um, and we may have a couple of follow-up questions. Currently, we're primarily focusing on any video content that's used over multiple semesters. So if it's a, a, a one semester kind of uh, video content recording of your class, that may not be the highest priority, um, unless maybe you've got a really large class, but we can start that dialogue and work on getting your, your video content captioned. Okay, that's captions. Um, any questions or anything? Uh, please, a question from the audience. I'll repeat it. What type of resources are available for people not at Utah State for captioning of videos and things? Fantastic. We, we do talk about this a little bit in the article that will be along with this. It, it's a great question. Um, so the question is, what resources are available maybe if you're not at Utah State um, or even if you're here at Utah State and just looking for content? Um, if you go to YouTube, for example, um, and are looking for educational content, which there's a lot of great content out there, there's a way you can filter um, your search to only look for videos that are actually captioned. Um, one of the things that we don't go into here, maybe a little bit more in our article, but it's just the idea, um, they're actually uh, not so affectionately called craptions, but these are the, uh, the machine captions that are generated often um, from YouTube and other services sometimes where a machine does the best it can. And there are some, some uh, humorous examples even out there um, that you can take a look at. Um, th those are generally just not considered adequate for accessibility, so you'd always want to make sure something is professionally captioned. Um, if you're using content from a, a textbook publisher um, or any other source generally, um, uh, we've had, and again, this is very different than it was even just two or three years ago, but most of that content is going to be captioned now, or if it's not, you can almost ask the publisher and say, hey, could I get a captioned version of this content? Uh, and again, most of those publishers have resources in place, if they haven't done it already, to get something captioned, hopefully within just a few days. Um, there are also resources available and out there that you can caption your own content, um, a little bit more time intensive. 
Um, I've heard of instructors who do that as part of the learning um, exercise, for example. Uh, each student might have to caption one video, a way for students to really engage with that material um, in, in another level. Um, but there's also tools and resources that are available. In YouTube, for example, if you upload a video, it will give you that machine caption, which will get you maybe 80% of the way there. And then you just need to go through and kind of double check, make sure that it's correct, add any punctuation, things like that. So good question. There are a lot of resources out there. And again, fortunately, more and more content is just captioned by default. For example, everything on Netflix that you might pull up is going to have a caption in at least one language. And that's part of it, I think, as well as just our students in general are getting used to having content, video content captioned. And so when they see content that isn't, it, it, it's just a, um, out of the ordinary for them. So good. And we'd love to, again, would love to hear from some of you on that. The next thing I want to talk about is PDF files <laughs> for a minute. This is just a, a headline from a specific article. I'll maybe pull up a, a, a couple of others. This is from the Nielsen Norman Group, just around usability, not accessibility specifically. Um, again, avoid PDF for on-screen reading. Um, if you don't trust uh, this specific person, I, if you just put a, a quick Google search into it, <laughs> um, you can see there, uh, if you can see it highlighted, the 31 million results that uh, it might agree with this sentiment. <laughs> this is the idea that PDF files are not very usable of a, of a, of a format. Now, um, that they are also um, the most common format used in our online courses, by far, um, in fact. Um, so if you're, you have PDF files in your course, we don't want anybody um, you know, uh, feeling any shame or anything like this. It's just part of what academia is and how we do things. Um, but I, and Jared mentioned these earlier, but we'll just pull up a couple of examples. These are all uh, real PDFs from previous uh, Utah State courses. Oh, before we do that, though, let me just mention this example um, that I, I think might be helpful. And so imagine for a moment you, you've uh, worked with City maybe to create a really beautiful online course. You have your navigation all cleaned up. You're maybe using some nice themes. And it's just a nice, beautiful experience for your students. Um, and they come into your course and click on the first link. Um, and, and it's this type of an experience, right, where a PDF file, um, and, and we never know exactly what's going to happen when you click on a PDF file. It might download to your computer, and you have to go track it down. It might open up in the page. It might open up in a new tab. It, it can be a, a, a jarring experience. Um, and again, we're somewhat acclimated to it um, in higher ed, but... Um, yeah, let's just look at a couple of, of potentially problematic. Again, these, these are not too uncommon of, of, of PDF files, right? Um, or maybe it's a scanned, maybe it's a file you got as a, as a, as a, a grad student, and, and we've got kind of both sides here at least. So um, you can maybe get, not get a crick in your neck. Um, here's one that was all, all the way upside down. Um, we, we came across. Um, but, but even if you have a nice, clean PDF file, you've gone to the, the online library and downloaded something like this, you say, oh, this is nice, it's a good experience, until maybe, um, again, it opens up in one of these um, unexpected ways, or a student tries to open this on their mobile phone, right? And again, we know more and more of our students are accessing our content on mobile. You're going to need a magnifying glass to read this, um, or you can do the zoom in thing and, and, and go back and forth and back and forth. It's just not a great experience. Um, uh, PDF files in general. I, Im imagine for a moment, for example, that um, you went to Amazon and, and did a search for new headphones, and every third link was a crooked or upside down, or you know, it just wouldn't be acceptable because it, it affects their bottom line. It makes the content harder to access and harder to get to. And, and with all these PDFs, the same principles apply. Uh, the, the, that content then becomes harder to read, harder to access, harder to, to ingest. Um, but it's kind of been what we've stuck with for however many decades. And maybe, uh, you know, you had to go through the PDF um, experience and you're going to make your students do the same. But, but we now have uh, some better ways to do this uh, that we just want to share. And so, so fortunately, there's some, so some great tools and resources available again on campus that can take a, a PDF file. Um, and, and we take it through a process. And, and we'll show you in a minute. You can do this yourselves. Or we have resources to do this for you, but it turns it into a nice, clean, um, accessible, uh, usable Canvas page. Um, and so when a student clicks on that link, it doesn't download or open a new window. It just shows up in Canvas just like any other content. A couple of other examples. Here's, here's one of a table. Um, again, you can see what that might look like as a Canvas page. 
Um, or, we do, yeah, generally. And so a lot of content, there may be use cases where a PDF file is still, is still useful or helpful. I think those are fewer and fewer, um, though. I mean, you can print very nice documents from Canvas, um, so PDF files aren't necessarily helpful there. But if somebody wants to download and save it for later, um, we generally, it's easy to make the PDF file available right there as well. Yep, and, and uh, when, as we do that, we see, um, we don't see as many clicks on the PDF files, right, that um, if, if it's available in this friendlier format, but yeah, we're not saying necessarily abolish all PDF files yet, um, or maybe today at least. Um, but but uh, so, so we'll make it available, especially for academic articles and things like that. It may make more sense. Here's another example. Um, again, this would just be a tough article to read on a mobile device. But if it's in a Canva page, it just opens up as a nice, clean, usable kind of format um, that someone can easily read when they're out for a walk or, or, or whatever it might be. Um, I want to look at a quick demo. Um, again, this is something you can do um, for yourself um, or have resources for you. But I just want to show a little bit about what the process is and so you can at least be maybe familiar on what it looks like. Here's a, a PDF file. It's not a particularly um, you know, um, difficult one um, per se, but, but has a lot of um, you know, background color and stuff like this. And, and what, we, what we do, or what you can do as a teacher, um, if you would like, but we can also do this for you, just come into Canvas, um, into your files area here. Uh, click on these three dots over here. There's a little uh, link that says Convert to Canvas page. This goes out, and what it does is it takes all the text out of that PDF file and creates a, a Canvas page for you. Now there is a warning here that says corrections may be needed. We want to make sure this isn't necessarily a perfect process. So if you're doing this yourself, um, you'll need to kind of double check and make sure that it looks okay. Um, or again, we have some resources that can help you. Just send an email um, to accessibility at usu.edu and we can just convert these files um, uh, for you. If, if you're not at Utah State, um, if you go to Google, we talk about this in our article, and just type in PDF to HTML, there are a bunch of free e uh, online tools that can do this for you. Um, but here you can see, again, you've got a, a nice clean Canvas page. It's not going to be perfect. I don't know what this is right here. I'd have to go in and edit and just clean it up a little bit or let us know and we can do that for you. But just the value of this, again, you can just kind of see a little bit. If I'm trying to open this PDF on a, on a mobile device, it's just not going to be a good reading experience versus a Canvas page. Um, you know, it's just going to be a much better reading experience for your students. And then the other thing we sometimes, now this is, there's different types of content that might be online. Sometimes it's going to be something like a, a, you know, a reading from an academic journal. We can do those. Um, we have uh, checked in quite a bit with any copyright concerns, and, and, and that's often a question that comes up, and that's something where as long as we have permission to use it in, in a PDF format, we're just fine to use it in this accessible alternative format as well. So that's not something that, that, that needs to be a concern. Um, and then the other thing is sometimes we have teachers who uh, write their content in Word, save it to PDF, and then upload it to their course. So it's kind of a three-step process. If you just put your content right into Canvas, then all you have to do is click on it um, and edit it right there. It's just a much easier process. I think we have a question from the audience. Yeah, Sarah has a question. How does this handle plots and figures? Good question. And so the, um, the tool that's available to teachers, um, we're working on helping it to pull in um, f images right now. That's not quite working, but we'll, we would do that for you. Um, and so just reach out to us again and we can, and I'm happy to share examples afterwards of some of those, but we, we bring in the images nice and clean. Um, if it's a table, we'll put it into an HTML table. If it's a plot or a more complicated math figure, um, we'll put it as an image likely, but then we have what's called the alternative text where we just describe the image on the back end a little bit. Um, one more feature that I'll just mention, um, for th and this is currently in place for all of your Canvas pages. Any student can click on this little A that you've probably seen um, and download your content as an audio file um, or in any of these other formats and take it and, and listen to that paper on the bus or when they're out for a run, whatever it might be. Um, but that's something that this does and makes possible. So, but again, and, and if it's something where you're nervous about it, we can just do one or two sample files for you. Um, but we've done this now for over 6,000 files. Um, I think there's about 80 or 90,000 to go still, so we're just kind of getting at it. But, but it's been um, 
it's been a good process. Um, we've got a good process in place where, it's we, where we do the conversion and then we kind of check it and double check it. Um, so, so the content, if there's a typo in your original document, we'll leave it in the HTML. But, that, but that's kind of, uh, it's a good process we kind of have in place for that. And just lastly, I would mention we are doing kind of some research on this as well. We're, we're quite confident the students prefer this. Um, but we're looking into that to kind of validate um, when they have the choice for a, a, a PDF or a Canvas page. Um, and then kind of what are some of the use cases where one format might be better than another, um, what's easier to use, and then, and then lastly, what the impact on learning is. Um, preliminarily, uh, just, it's, it's just a better format. We've seen a lot of good just that the students prefer this. And then eat teachers, it, it just ends up being easier as well. So we'd love to help you do that. Um, but again, those are just two practices. Now, we do have a lot of other things you can do in your Canvas course to help out. There's workshops available where we go more into detail on some of those things. But, but these are just a couple of practices that we've talked about where, uh, again, we kind of started from a place of accessibility, but we feel like adding captions to your documents, to your videos, or taking your PDF documents and making them available as HTML Canvas pages are going to make your content significantly more uh, accessible but also uh, just more usable for every single student in your content, in your, sorry, in your class um, that comes into your online course. Uh, one thing we didn't mention about PDF, besides the usability problems, they are just not very accessible. It's really difficult for a student um, who is blind, but then all, also other disabilities, just to access that content in a very usable way. So this is a, a great way to make it um, both accessible and more usable to have it just be presented um, as inclusive design. Uh, usable for everyone. Um, that's it as far as our official presentation, but we'd love to, if anybody has additional questions about any of these things or other questions you might have about accessibility, we're, we're here and happy to answer those. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, good, Sarah. So um, just to make sure on, on uh, now again, uh, just to make sure that this tool that's automated, and, and again, we're working on this, and so I would think by within a month or two, it'll do those conversions for you. But in the meantime, like, like Neil said, we have a small army of students who are doing these conversions. We've been able to tap into some student groups on campus, some student workers who are very busy at times and not as busy at other times, and we have a pretty great training program where they go through to do these conversions. They would pull all those figures, um, equations, et cetera, out. We do use um, MathJax and MathML uh, specifically for your math equations. I mean, we have some great tools to do that um, if, if, if that's an issue, and we'd be happy to show those to you. Maybe speak to your just a class experience as well on that those conversions. Yeah, just I was going to say that I'm also and, and we're working on making this like a, just like a two thousand level course. But in my own course, where we actually their service learning is they work with City and Christopher, so my students are actually producing and and captioning videos and they're taking uh, assignments from and readings from cor courses across campus. Anyway, we're turning that into a I forget which course it is CL. <laughs> I forget what it's called, but it's going to be like a 2,000 level course. It's not just going to be for our major specific. It's going to be a course that people could take like in their, as a sophomore, and they could learn the, some of these skills so that we have more and more students, um, whatever major they end up going to, who already are thinking about some of these things and already have the skills. And, like have a, and part of that is that we teach, with Christopher's help, not just, oh, if you have this software, kind of the question you were talking about, but hey, what, what would you use if you didn't have Camtasia or Adobe? What would you use to caption? And we talk about, and they, they'll experiment with different ways to caption things. So we're actually, we're, that, right now that class is a, just for our major, but we're working on making it uh, breadth. Some, anyway, I am not one of those people who knows all those, de those designations, but we're working on doing that so that you might even have students in your classes in the future who are like, I already know how to do that, which would be really great. So. I just shared some, a link to some examples in the chat you can take a look at as well if you want to see some more examples. But we'd also be happy to do some examples from your course if you're nervous about it. And we always make sure to, of course, get any permission um, from you before making any changes. I had two questions, but I think you just answered mine. So one was with your little army of students who are working on this. 
does the instructor know before they're making yeah. the changes? So, so, so the question was, would an instructor know before we would do any of these changes? Um, and there are a couple of, ch uh, uh, to address that, there are a couple of accessibility changes we might kind of proactively do ourselves in your course, um, where we might add just a description to an image, but nothing that would ever change a file format or something like this. So we would always reach out to you and wait for permission. We usually just give you a list of the files we plan on converting, um, get your permission, and then once they're converted, we send you a list of all the converted pages. Um, so and you can all, it's the kind of thing you can always go back, but to date, out of the hundreds of courses, nobody has wanted to, if that may, but it's, it's, it's a pretty solid process. But yeah, we would absolutely get your permission first. And some types of PDF content maybe don't lend themselves as well to this, right? If maybe it's a PDF form they have to fill out, that's not going to make sense as a, as a Canvas page. So it does have its place. It's just a small place, <laughs> much smaller than, than what it is currently. Did you have a second Another question? question I have, and, and you guys have helped me a lot with captioning and some videos, which I really appreciated. But every once in a while I notice a mistake. And so is there a way for me to correct that, or do I need to reach out to your office? Good question. Good. So we, we do use a captioning service that is better than machine captions, but it's not perfect. So if you see something, especially around a technical term, for example, that's just maybe not exactly right, um, there is a way to caption that, um, I can, uh, to go in and fix or edit those captions. Um, I don't know that a demo right here, but if you just go, if you send me an email, I can send you the instructions. There's a uh, a page on the, the teach.usu.edu USU slash teach website that goes over that process of editing captions. But we're also happy to kind of walk you through that. It's pretty click, slick though. You just click edit and it's just like a word editor. You would go in and make any changes. Just press save and then it's there in your, in your video going forward. I think that's again another fun thing you might encourage your students to say, if you see an error, you know, maybe it's a, an extra point if, you've, if you find it and then you can fix it and make it available for students going forward. We're also happy to make those corrections for you as well if that's easier, but, but you, there is a way you can do it. In, it's in the My Media section. If you click on an individual video, there's just an Edit Captions button there. So, Any other questions at all? I have a question for someone. Please. Um, I'm interested in, in the difference because I see some things in the materials we use for ETE that have transcriptions. Um, and I'm really interested in this, that thing seems really cool. So yeah. I have two, one question is, is that in Kaltura, in Kaltura? Mm -hmm. that, like that's where you have to have the media Save Good question. So let me address that question real quick yes. first. So it's a, the question is around transcripts. We saw that interactive transcript flare. Um, does our media, to use that, would our media need to be in Kaltura? And, and, the answer is probably yes. Again, there are other services that provide something similar, um, like YouTube. Every YouTube video actually automatically has an automatic transcript built in. Um, it's kind of a hidden feature, but any video you can see that. Um, again, like TED.com, I think somebody might have mentioned, has that so you can embed their videos. But for in our courses here, it will need to be a Kaltura video to use that interactive transcript player. It'll just be a different Kaltura player or skin. Um, there's kind of one that's available right now, but just doesn't work as great. And there's a new version coming out. Again, they've told me they told me early next month. So hopefully before spring semester that you'll be able to use. It'll have all of that functionality kind of built in. So if you just upload a video as an MP4 file, it's difficult to add either captions or have a transcript associated with it. But if it's in Kaltura, we'll we'll be able to do that and use that feature. The second right. question. And so that because I've done things, you know, where it's like a student makes a video and it's 30 seconds or a minute and so I feel like that transcription feels like kind of an easier middle ground mm -hmm. um, and so I just wonder like in terms of accessibility kind of where that where that Lies, if that makes sense. Like, so like a machine, a machine transcription. transcription. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is a, so talking about the machine transcriptions, and one way that you could all kind of test that, um, right at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can see a live transcript button. If you click on that and show subtitle, um, you'll actually see a, a, an automatic transcript or machine transcript and what that's done. Now, just a few years ago, as I'm watching this as I talk, it's doing a pretty good job. Um, just a few years ago, that wasn't the case. I, I think you're often seeing, um, you know, 70 to 80 percent accuracy. Which, uh, if, if imagine again, not hearing every fifth word someone says, it's not a very good experience. Um, 
so, so, so it's, it, and, and I think now we're seeing um, up to 90%, maybe even a little bit higher sometimes. Um, there you go. Yep, you're seeing some things, Calgary instead of Kaltura. Yep, so that's the type of thing that someone might miss out on on that. But yeah, I think, um, especially if it's a class where you're doing this proactively, um, I mean, if it's a student, if you have a student who is deaf or hard of hearing in your class, we're just going to need to make sure everything is professionally captioned. Um, but something like a, a class recording, um, you know, honestly, not a lot of students are watching those anyways. Um, but if they do, having that, that machine transcription is going to be great. Um, and that, that's fine to do. Um, it's, you know, I, I think that's great. I think it's definitely a better than nothing type of a thing. I mean, in some cases, it's getting to where it's almost. Comp I mean, I, I can see in the next few years as the artificial intelligence or machine learning models get better and better that it'll just be universally available on every video everywhere. We're not there yet, and so if it's like content you plan on using or high value content, we might call it get it professionally captioned. But yeah, for a thirty second student submission, a machine caption is going to be great. You can take this. Thank you. Yeah. Gotta wear mic. Okay, I'm going. All right. Good. All right. Well, we want to thank Christopher and Jared for their time. If you want to follow up on some of that information that they chatted about, you can check out Resilient Pedagogy, which is open access. You can access it from the ETE website. Um, if you Google or search engine ETESU, you'll find it in the publications tab. Um, and we are excited to be doing a podcast with Christopher and Jared next week, which will also be available on our ETE YouTube station. So keep, keep uh, out for that. That's coming soon. And um, thanks for joining us. We'll see you at the next seminar.